Earl Ray of Recovering from Religion. They were kind enough to write a blurb for me. But it's really the story of my life. And I was an evangelical, charismatic, tongue-talking Christian for over three and a half decades. And you might wonder, how can an intelligent person do that for that long? Well, it's, it's called indoctrination. It's called a lack of critical thinking. And it's called life in America, because a lot of people do believe that. Um, about 12 years ago, I started really investigating through a series of, of well, it, lifelong, really, uh, doubts and questions that never seemed to have answers. And uh, after too much of that, the, the cumulative effect of that, uh, boy, that moon is pretty, y'all. Don't look yeah. at Yeah, no. no, we did already. Yeah. Um, I really just started investigating the faith that I've had for years and came to the conclusion that there was no God and never had been a God. And I've been having this one great relationship all my life. Um, and as I look back on the whole of my life, I realized he'd never been there. He'd never done anything. And so I'm, I'm an atheist uh, and a humanist and an agnostic, um, <laughs> all the things. And then about three years ago, I was diagnosed with ALS, terminal illness, Lou Gehrig's disease. It's, it's, it's progressing really slowly, thankfully. And um, I'm still able to walk somewhat. I mean, it's slow and, and um, I get tired, but I'm able to talk, as you can see. My symptoms are mostly in my hands and arms. If you're lucky enough to sit next to me, I probably flung food on you trying to do that. <laughs> but um, I've been, since then, I've, I've begun talking about living and dying and a thing we, we or, an organization we call Dying Out Loud. And uh, you, I think you had a friend of mine, Lon Ostrander, in your group a few weeks ago. Uh, January, I, he spoke to that. Yeah, and uh, he had a picture of me on the back wall and someone yeah. asked, what was that? So that was, yeah, Robert did, uh, the inquisitive one. Uh, and that's kind of, it was one of our uh, shirts, I think, or one of our uh, graphic images we developed as part of the organization that Lon had gotten him framed in. He's, he and our good friends, I was on the board of the clergy project for several years. Actually, until I got diagnosed, and then I realized I'm going to die really quick, so I'm about to get busy doing some other things. Really, that was my reaction immediately, is I'm going to, um, live as much life as I can, as fast as I can, until until um, I can't do the things I want to do anymore, and then I will check out. Uh, I, I was connected. I still uh, do some work for an organization called the Final Exit Network, mm -hmm. which is it, it's an orga a great organization that helps people end things on their own terms when life is no longer uh, really worth living. If you're terminal, someone like me. And so the Dying Out, Loud, Dying Out Loud organization just developed kind of organically. I started getting uh, on YouTube shows. And you may have seen me on the Atheist Experience or some of the other shows that I've been on. I got to know a bunch of the atheist activists. I'd been an atheist for a lot of years. It never was what you'd consider an activist. But I felt like with the short time I had left, rather than just living it to travel and consume pleasure, I, I thought I would do some things that meant something to somebody. And so I started hearing from people all over the world that uh, found inspiration in me talking about really kind of just pulling the lid off of death and talking about it out loud. And because it's something we're all going to face. Some of us are closer than others. But uh, coming out of the evangelical world, I knew a lot of people who came out of that world. And there's a fear of death and an uneasiness around that subject. And so me talking about it and living my life out loud and grabbing the moments and making the most of the life we have really kind of galvanized and and I love the way that dog is sitting right now. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> that is so great. He's listening very carefully. Yes, <laughs> you are. And he's stable. Nobody's gonna tip him over. <laughs> We'll see. That's why he's. They said he was going to die in 24 hours when they did it. They lied to you too, didn't they? <laughs> yeah. They told me three to five years of life. That was the prognosis, and most of those years would be in a wheelchair, unable to talk and eat, and those kind of things. So I'm, I'm beating those odds. I've got a really slow, progressive form of ALS. Um, Bev and I have been together this whole time. She's my partner and my caregiver, and just helps me with everything. 
Oh, she's wearing a sweatshirt. You might enjoy that GD show. And that GD stands for, you could say that goddamn show. Has the way. <laughs> she's got great hair. Um, but it also stands for Genevieve and Dave. Genevieve's my co-host. And we have a show every Monday night on YouTube. It's on the Dave Warnock Dying Out Loud channel. And we interview uh, interesting people. We talk about interesting subjects. We're actually having a show that we're gonna, re we're gonna not record, but we'll be doing it from San Jose this week, next week on the circumcision. We're gonna talk to um, a guy who's been uh, working for years protesting the practice of circumcision. Um, and so we talk about subjects like that, but we also, talk about um, what the Christian influence of that is in this country because a lot of a lot of the things that we deal with in America are heavily influenced by the evangelical mindset that is kind of like a current that runs under the whole country. And we try to talk about things that expose that and, and make sense of that. So it's a good show. I think you'll like it if you can tune in. It's 7 o'clock Eastern Time. It's a live call-in show. Call in if you want. Um, we'll answer can I ask but, you a question? Yes, of course. How, why is an evangelical afraid to die if they're going to join yeah. God? Yeah. <laughs> That's the question I've been asking. Because <laughs> they've all got that little nagging doubt. Yeah. Yeah. What if I got as it wrong? As much as they got to profess yeah. their faith. I think it's partly that, but I've, I've, I've talked about that a lot in the last three years, and I've had questions like that. And I've even talked to Christians and asked them, and they don't really have an answer, but I think it's this. The evangelical world takes death, it, it doesn't treat death as the final thing. It treats it as a, you're pausing and then you're going to heaven. You close your eyes and you wake up with Jesus. Well, if your, your rational mind knows that's bullshit, <laughs> your, your rational mind knows that doesn't make any sense, how could that possibly be a thing? And so there's that nagging doubt in the back of their minds and because they've, they've treated it as a fairy tale all their life, when it's when you really have to wrestle with it and really have to you're facing it you're really afraid because you haven't come to terms with your own mortality and you've been taught that this life is just a preview for eternal life when it's not it's the one life we have that we know we have well, we don't know what's on the other side none of us have ever been there and come back regardless of whatever stupid book it is we may see, uh, including the bible um, but I think there's a there's a nagging doubt in their minds because they've never really... The Bible talks about death as an enemy. The, the last enemy that shall be defeated is death. And when you treat it that way, then you don't embrace it. You're afraid of it and you avoid it. So I think that's the long answer. It, it may not... I think most of them don't really know why, but they are. They're more afraid of death than most atheists I know. Um, if any of you do want a copy of the book, I'd be happy to sign it for you. Oh, yeah. Um, it'll be uh, worth a lot of money one of these days when, <laughs> <laughs> when I'm famous and dead. <laughs> Imagine having a signed book by D Stephen Hawking, right? <laughs> of course, he couldn't sign anything. Um, <laughs> mine's nothing but a pretty bad scribble. But How do we join your talk out loud? The dying out loud? The show? Just tune in on YouTube. Uh, at four o'clock your time, it's seven Eastern. It's for an hour and a half, or you can watch it afterwards. I mean, uh, it's it's recorded and it's it's uploaded as soon as we, we finish it. So where on YouTube do we go? Uh, the, my Slide channel is called Dave Warnock Dying Out Loud. That's just you, you search for that. Dave if you, if you search for that, you'll live. you'll find the show there. And if you happen to go four o'clock on Monday, then you can see, you it, see live. it live happening. And then they can type in you questions. Can type and in chats. You can stuff. actually call in. We have a call. Oh. We have a phone number. Oh. You can actually call in with questions or comments. Um, any other questions, by the way? Of any of what does it sound like when you speak in tongues? Wow. <laughs> How do you cast out Actually, demons? Yeah, yeah. How do you cast out demons? You have yeah. a dictionary for that? Does anybody have a demon in them? <laughs> well, probably all do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you're getting along with them, right? Yeah. <laughs> they take hands, though. I, you know, casting out demons was something we believed it was a thing. But I can't say that I ever actually did it. I, I may have prayed for someone to, to 
for a demonic influence to be removed. But I can't. Nothing ever happened. Did you Did you believe that people would really have demons? I did. I believed oh. in demons and angels and. Huh. Yeah. It It was. It was. It's embarrassing. The things I believe. In. Oh. Uh, it really is. I, I just love. You know. But I live by a Maya Angelou quote that I love. Mm -hmm. And she says, do the best you can do until you know better. Then mm -hmm. when you know better, do better. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I like that. It's pretty simple. But it's profound. Mm -hmm. And I was doing the best I knew. It was what I knew, yeah. what I yeah. believed. Yeah. I didn't go to college because I thought Jesus was coming soon. Uh, oh, if you want yeah. a snapshot That's of the Jesus crazy. movement and yeah. evangelical Christianity, uh, as one review, uh, what did he say? It was like a... a, a, a uh, an anthology, an American anthology in, in evangelicalism. Um, some reviewer guy wrote. Oh, you're talking about your book? The review on Amazon, yeah. Oh, okay. So it really kind of goes through almost four decades of evangelicalism and the way the way that I thought and believed was pretty indicative of the movement as a whole. The, the evangelical charismatic movement. Mm -hmm. Um, I always make sure I differentiate that from more mainline Christianity like Episcopal and Catholic and Methodist and Lutheran. They were tame and not crazy, <laughs> uh, but we didn't consider them real Christians because they weren't <laughs> believing the Bible and, and praying for people to be healed and things like that. So I believe some pretty crazy things, but I was taught it and I was uh, it was an earnest, true belief of mine. I wasn't something I took lightly um, and it was I was all in until I wasn't was, I was all in until I was all out yeah. and when I quit believing it was really um, a very rapid transition I didn't a lot of people I know that, that leave evangelicalism try to step down to a more nicer nicer version of Christianity and you know try to maintain that there's something out there and, there's, you know, some, you know, I just kind of said, no, nope, I don't some believe energy, any of it. Some spirit. Yeah, I don't believe any of it. It's just, none of it makes sense. The life, this world makes way more sense <laughs> without a God. You know, it, it, the world works like it would if there were no God. Period. Well said. So when, no, you when you were not. talking in tongues. Y'all were fascinated with that. Yeah. Yeah. Did you know what you were saying? No, only the, only the Holy Spirit did. I see. Yeah. And how did you learn how to do that? It's a it's a learned behavior. I was um, I was taught by some people that prayed for me to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is what it's called. And they kind of train you. You hear other people doing it. You kind of imitate them. Mm -hmm. okay. And you just it's a learned behavior. It's a muscle memory. That's why I can still do it today. No Holy Spirit required. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just something that. See, it's learned behavior. Interesting. So you're taught that. Yeah. You oh, just yeah. pick up. You, you pick up unintelligible syllables uh, strung together by hearing other people do it, and you imitate them. That's what, what I think. Can we try it? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> you say, say it again. Shambhara, shambhara, lambhara, 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 shambhara. They don't have to rhyme. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds a little inauthentic if it rhymes. You've got a career here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you've got a career here. It is their first uh, talking oh. in tongues lesson. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you, and, and there are people, and, and what is the value of that within, uh. what, why is that, is it, it, it would be a waste of time doing it? Well, is, is it like God's language or it's, something? Yeah, or? It's, it's like you're, the more of those spiritual gifts is what that was re referenced as. The more spiritual gifts you operate in, the more, the closer you are to God, the more huh. uh, holy, the more uh, s sanctified you are. It, you're just, the whole idea is to get as close to God as possible. So the more you pray, there's a scripture that says, we know not, we know not what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself gives utterance with groanings that cannot be uttered with so oh. so it's an idea that I don't know how to pray but God does and if I pray in tongues I'm praying perfect prayers oh. mm. that's the idea okay huh. so I was born Jewish and I'm humanist and I don't believe in God and then I pray to God sometimes and I, I don't question I just well, you're not expecting anyone to answer. You're just, it's kind right. of a meditation, I, I, right? Right, paying yeah. for goodness and love and sharing. Yeah. And the difference is we thought there was some sky daddy listening and that he would answer our prayers. Mm. Did you know there's been a group, you all probably know this, 
people think Santa Barbara is the most spiritual place on the face of the earth. I thought that was Sedona. Oh, my. Sedona. That's Sedona. Yeah, we're doing our best to not have it be the most spiritual place on the planet. So we've got a lot of work to do, if that's true. And why don't we want it to be? <laughs> well, a lot of people call themselves spiritual but not religious. Where they, you know, I, Whatever that means. Kind of woo-woo to me. But yeah. I don't know what that means. I'm more of a, you know, I want evidence. If, it's, if I can't see it, touch it, feel it know it's there give me some scientific evidence behind it i don't see much value in it you know if you want to meditate that's fine if you want to believe there's an energy in the universe that you're connected with that's fine it's not hurting anyone if you do that unless you're trying to impose that on someone but i just don't see much value in it because what is that how is that helping you know if, if meditation or thinking that calms you down and makes you feel better then go ahead you know not hurting anyone yeah getting back to not necessarily speaking in tongues <laughs> but well it's just did you have a feeling that came over you before you did something or was this a no. conscious i'm conscious going to decision. do the, okay it's like we, we there were some pentecostal job some pentecostal strains teach that, that, that the Holy Spirit comes over you and takes over and you're out of control. That's some of the videos you'll see with the shaking and the crazy behavior and the, and the, and the handling of snakes. And those are kind of some far out there groups. We didn't consider that. We considered that crazy. We only believe normal things like snakes that talk to women and men that walk on water. water. And you know, apples. Stuff, yeah, right. They, right, right. But yes. we did, Perfectly I, reasonable absurdities. Right. We uh, we were taught that it was, uh, it was a, a conscious decision. I'm okay. going to pray in the spirit now. I'm going to pray in tongues okay. because I want to pray prayers that, that are closer to God kind of stuff. Because when I was a child in, in, in attending a church and people would you know the, the minister would you know feel the spirit and come on down and, yeah. and be saved and people would stand and go down and 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 i never knew what they were feeling because i never felt that <laughs> and so I, my question i guess was basically what did you feel or it was just a conscious yeah, yeah and, you, and you yeah. answered that so it wasn't necessarily in that tongues but I never knew what people were feeling when they existed. Because they were feeling peer pressures, what they were feeling. Well, there is a, there is a neurological, there is some neurological yeah. stuff that goes on in those mystical experiences. And then there's been studies done, you know, you've, you've seen it in tribal and, and native tribal countries and places, places where people kind of get out of themselves. Mm -hmm. There's some neuro, neuro, neurological stuff going on. A little self-hypnosis. Yeah, uh, there's some... Peyote. <laughs> There's some things happening in your brain that that can be a, like a, a speaking in tongues kind of thing, or it can be something in completely non-religious. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when John Wathy was here a couple years ago, and he said? Um, there's the infant, mommy, mommy. There's like this, so there's yeah. something up there to save me, and I'm helpless. Thing, and that that's a very it triggers kind of old part of the brain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that mommy, infant, mm -hmm. mommy. Mm. All these endorphins and things, yeah, and those stuff. Kind of things. Yeah. Did you really believe that? First of all, that that, that God even cared. Mm -hmm. He did. Yeah. And that he was interested in, in what are babblings that come out of his mouth? Yeah. And that was There's important. Seven, seven billion people. Yeah. yeah, we believe that the God of the universe could pay attention to everyone's prayers all at once. Okay. The, very, the scripture, the very hairs of your head are numbered, and that you're more valuable than, than the sparrows. And, and, we're, you're, and when you're taught that you're the most important thing in the universe, and that the God of the universe pay special attention to everything you say and do. It's watching you all the time. Uh, yeah, you believe that he, not only that he cared, but also that you'd get in trouble if you did something wrong because he's right there watching you. Why did you have to say it then if he already knew? <laughs> That's a good question. There's not a, there's not a good answer for that. And, and when you're taught that by the people who love you, Right? Yeah. Your parents yeah. are teaching you. The authority aunt, figures. Your, uncle, yeah. your grandma, your grandpa. Yeah. The bulk of the people that I knew, you know. yeah, yeah. I, I came into faith as an 18 year old out of high school at a very impressionable, vulnerable age. But most of the people are, they grow up in it, they're indoctrinated from, from birth to believe this. And so 
uh, you, you just believe what the authority figures tell you. You don't question it. And I, I, I've come to see that as a form of child abuse. You know, you don't, especially when you're teaching that they're, that they're broken and, and in need of a savior and they're going to hell if they don't get one. That's horrible. And I know people who really suffer trauma from that years later. Yeah, I remember reading one guy who stepped away from the evangelicalism, and he, but the way he was raised is that because Jesus is going to come any moment, you don't know when, yeah. and so you have to be right with Jesus every single minute of yeah, your life. Yeah, you're always afraid was, of stepping afraid, out of line, yeah, exactly. even thought that's crimes. What, I mean, that's what he was afraid of. You know, that, if you look yeah. upon a woman to lust after, you've committed yeah, adultery in your heart. I'm sure that right. happened pretty much all the time. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's a man. <laughs> but I was I was caught up in the Jesus movement in, in right at the end of 1973, and it was the time of the rapture and Armageddon and the mm -hmm. Antichrist and Jesus Christ, Christ superstar. superstar. Jesus Christ superstar. I went, to, I went to see Godspell in Washington D.C. in the summer of '72. Um, I, I didn't go to college because I believed that Jesus was coming back so soon, that would be a waste of time. I needed to be uh, doing coffee house ministry, preaching on the street, getting people saved, because I, 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 those that were left behind would be doomed for eternity. I really believed that. So it was, I was all in. And then, you know, you get caught, I get caught up in it, and the next thing I know I'm getting married and having a family. and. It, then it's too late to go back to college. I got to make a living, so it's just a cycle that went on for the next 35 years. Now, did you raise your children in the faith? Yep. And what's your relationship with them now? Well, I detail that in the book. Okay. <laughs> okay, got it. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm cool with you, that. I'm, I'm cool not, with not that. trying to sell you a book. Um, I, I was shunned by my daughters, and okay. one of them I still don't have a relationship with. One of them has kind of come back around. My oldest one. Um, those that were sitting close to us heard some of this, but at the table. Mm -hmm. But there's, I got six grandkids, and three of them I never see. Um, my son, who lives in New York City, he and his wife, they pretty much let go of the God idea. They pretty much live as though there's no God. But my two daughters are both married to. Uh, one of them is married to a man who pastors. They pastor a church down in Florida, mm -hmm. and my other daughter lives in Minnesota, and they're very fervent Christians, and they don't have anything to do with me because. They don't want to embrace my atheism. They, they, they feel like it's like, uh, like if you had a, a drug addict son who, who you were led to live with you and do his drugs, you'd be enabling that. That's kind of the way they look at that. They kind of need to keep distance from me so that I'll repent and return to God. Now both my Not to mention, they might worry that it's contagious. <laughs> yeah, they could think I'd they, they, they get on them, yeah. Uh, my oldest daughter had that position for a long time, and only for the last year and a half, though, she's kind of changed in that regard, and we reconnected, and I've seen the grandkids and had some time with them. I don't know what's caused that, because I've not changed my position. I'm as public and vocal as I've ever been, more so than I've ever been. So, I mean, it's out there. I'm not hiding anything from anyone, so she has to know what I'm about, but for whatever reason, she's opened the door.